yes, this meeting is being recorded. Okay, so, um, um, and Phoebe Bohanna wants to be, and I'll admit her. Um, so yeah, this is um, a strange time. So we're all on lockdown at different, uh, in different time zones around the world. And I've just learned recently that I, as you know, hate giving um, lectures to a computer screen by myself. So I decided that it'd be great to invite some some um, some experts in to talk to us about different issues. And today I have asked my uh, long, long time distant colleague, Professor Benjamin Arditi, who is Professor of Political Science um, at UNAM in Mexico, to, um, to talk to us a little bit about the concept of, um, of the body as it functions in, in political senses or in political theory. Um, because on the on the module so far, Ben, we've often talked about, or I've often talked about the way that um, a kind of model of a society sort of implies an ideal citizen or an ideal type of subject. And you can see that in different sorts of ways, in different kinds of nationalist um, projects that, that, that at, at different countries at different times have kind of imagined the ideal physical specimen the, with the ideal moral character and intellectual values and so on. Um, and then obviously that, so, so on the one hand, you've got the, the sense of the, the, the body as something imagined within political ideology, <clears throat> um, political projects or propaganda. But in another sense, you also have the idea of society as a, um, as a body. I mean, this, so I know this in terms of like, it goes all the way back to kind of Elizabethan worldviews. You know, I, you know, I've, I've, you know, in Shakespeare plays, they talk about, you know, the, the body politic as something like a garden that needs to be groomed and or a certain part of the body needs to be in balance with another. And also in, in you know, classical philosophy, you have people like Plato who argued things around like, the, what is the ideal person shouldn't be too intellectual, otherwise they become too kind of effete and soft, but they shouldn't be, they shouldn't be too physical because then they become brutish. Um, so I just wondered if you could say, tell us a little bit about the, the way that the, the body functions as a concept or a trope, it, you know, some landmarks in political thinking, political theory, political philosophy maybe. I can only tell you from the point of view of political theory, which is what I do. Um, before I start, there's cultural studies has been using the notion of the body with a relation to affect for quite a while now, but it only came into political theory in the last 20 years. Perhaps the first ones to introduce it uh, massively were um, Hart and Negri with the publication of Empire. That was in 2000. But before that, the body was quite absent of political theory and of philosophy. It was more the mind than, uh, rather than the body. And I think it's, it's good that we're starting to pay more attention to the body now. Um, about the idea of the body politic, I imagine it's uh, the first people to think about this in antiquity, they probably saw it as, as a nice metaphor. You know, the head would be the ruler, the arms or the hands would be the soldiers, and the feet would be the underdogs, usually the peasants, manual workers, uh, artisans, whatever. The metaphor remained, and in Europe, it became extremely popular during the Middle Ages. Part of this was because of the fight between um, earthly powers and the church, who is to have command. And of course, the earthly powers won. And the way there's a guy that, as far as I know, he's the, the, the most, the brightest one. I'm in the middle of, sorry, but I have a little daughter that That's just okay. ran in. Did you want to deal with her? you want to talk to her or? or? No. Okay. She was desperate because it was an, a spider. Um, a man called Ernst Kantorovich, in the mid 50s, he published a book called The King's Two Bodies. It's quite a difficult read because it's, if I remember correctly, was something like 450, 500 pages long. But the man does the, the best study about the medieval political thought and medieval theology with regards to politics. And he comes up with a very nice summary of the idea of the body politic. And he says that 
for the medie medieval thinking, the body politic was really two bodies. The king had two bodies. One body was, what do we know, the body of uh, Charles I or whoever you want to think that is going to disappear at some point because of biological obsolescence. But there's another body, the second body, which is the body of the crown, monarchy. And that is in principle eternal. So you can kill one body, the body of the king, but the idea is that you cannot kill monarchy. And it was not until I read him that I realized that this line that you usually hear in old British tales, which is when a king dies is, uh, the king is dead, long live the king. The meaning of that was that the physical king died, but the monarchy continues with the next king. So it was, for me, it was like, woof. It opened my mind about it. So you have this tradition of thinking the body either as a metaphor, sorry, thinking politics using the body as a metaphor, or thinking the idea of sovereignty in terms of the body. Now, that started to, to collapse with modernity, basically. Um, and it's quite a nice uh, paradox when, I don't know if any of you guys have read uh, Leviathan by Thomas Hobbes. Uh, the book was published in 1651, immediately after the Glorious Revolution and the signing of the Westphalia Treaty in 1648 that put an end to religious wars in Europe, the, the wars between Protestants and Catholics. And he proposes, he has a, a brilliant theory of, of sovereignty as that which will put on put an end to the state of nature which he defines as war if you look at the cover of that book the famous cover it's a huge man with a crown and he has in one hand can remember the right or the left in one hand he has a sword which symbolizes earthly power and on the other hand he has something that i can't remember the name it's like a it's like a ball it, sorry, it's like a, like a curved cane, which has a cross at some point. Bishops usually use it for ceremonies. It has a name, but it escapes me now. Which symbolizes... Like a scepter or something. Sorry? Something like a scepter or something. Or a, We can look that up later, yeah. I can't remember the name. Uh, it's, it's not a word that I have used regularly. Okay. They use it for ceremony. So in the case of, of England, that you have the sovereign, the, the, the monarch, is simultaneously the head of the church, you have those two things symbolized there. But what is interesting is that his body is made up by hundreds of little people. Uh, I, I think it's something like 200, 300 little people. That was, an, that was a way of uh, paying homage to this idea of the body politic. But it was also his way of symbolizing that the strength of the sovereign comes from a compact, an agreement done with all the subjects. So what is the sovereign? Where, where does his power reside? Not in terms of, this is nothing, uh, no connection with democracy. The power of the sovereign, the strength of the sovereign lies in this compact that he does with the people. They give him the strength. And the string has one purpose, and the purpose is to protect their lives, their liberty, and their estate, as the line goes. So it would seem that Hobbes is rehashing this idea of the, the, the body politic again. But while he does that with the beautiful design of the first edition of Leviathan, at the same time, he says that the sovereign, since he is he or she, is the product of an agreement is always an artificial construction. So we start with the idea of the body, but he gives us a very modern and I would say prefiguring uh, the industrial revolution images. He gives us an idea that this body is not the more, it's not a, a natural, a, bled, a flesh and bone body, uh, the body of sovereignty, but it is a purely artificial body. That's why in the preface, or the introduction to Leviathan, he talks about the difference between what God did and what we did. 
God, he says, creates natural man. What we do is create artificial man, and we'll give it a name. The name is Leviathan. It's the mortal God. I don't know if you want me to go on or people well, want to I mean, So we get the idea, I mean, there's lots of interesting themes here, I guess, in terms of the, the way in which the, the, the image of, of, of the monarch is, is, is reliant on, on images of bodies. And then there's a kind of transcendent, there's a sort of transcendent of a, of a, of a, a disembodied body that, um, that, that is what main, that is what maintains almost like in a kind of platonic sense. But I'm wondering if you, if, if, I mean, when do you think the idea of power and the idea of the body of society as a construct, when do you think that became a really conscious um, idea? You know, I'm thinking of people like Lefort and, um, and Leclau, obviously. I mean, when, when did those kind of ideas of, of this is all just a construct um, really start to, to emerge? You mean the critique of the idea of the body or the, the rehashing of the idea of the body? I guess the critique. The critique, the, the source for, for Lefort, the, first, the source for Laclau is Lefort. And the source of Lefort is Kandorovich. Uh, in fact, I only read Kandorovich because I had read Lefort and I wanted to understand where he was coming from. Um, it's, it's, let me put it in this, in this way. What I was saying is that the idea of the body really never, never completely worked. But where it starts to, to be undone is with this wonderful cover of Leviathan. Because on the one hand, you say, yes, we have the body. But since the body is made up of little people, and those little people are there just because they made an agreement, that means that the body is no longer natural. So you have two unnatural institutions. One is, who is the person that can occupy power? And the other is, what is power? There's no divine right here. There's nothing related to divinity. So it's very secular, a very modern image to, for, for me. Um, I'm not totally sure what happens in the 19th century, but I know that the image of the body is replaced by the image of the machine uh, during the, the age of the industrial age. Uh, not the early 19th century, but in the late 19th century, the machine was all powerful. And we see it in the writers of the early 20th century, the, uh, the time machine, uh, the trip to the moon, this, these ideas of H.G. Uh, Wells, they, uh, this fascination with technology and with machines is part of the industrial spirit of the 19th century. Now, somebody like Lefort, what he does is, he does a brilliant, a brilliant reading of Kantorovich and very creative, because he says, he tries to explain what democracy is. Coming from political science, you usually say, well, democracy is a government uh, by the people. Or you say it's based on representation, or there are elections and you select people. And he says, yeah, all those things have to do with democracy. But democracy is something else, he says. Democracy is the experience of the disincorporation of power. That is, that for the first time you can imagine power without a body. And by this he means something very simple. He says, whoever exercises power can do it only because he or she has a mandate and only for a certain period of time. So he says, a class, a person, a party, or a group, a tribe, cannot appropriate body, uh, power, because if they do, they have exited democracy, they abandoned democracy. So for democracy to exist, power cannot be incarnated in a body. Now, for me, that's revolutionary, a brilliant reading, because it, it creates this idea, introduces this idea of power as a purely symbolic thing that circulates, circulates among bodies. He's never saying that there is a power vacuum. What Lefort is saying is that power has no owner, but there's people that are very powerful and they exercise power, but it no longer belongs to that body. 
it can be used, but it cannot be possessed. I think that that's one of the most brilliant destructions of the metaphor of the body. And the last, uh, the last, le, the coup de grace of uh, this idea of the body comes with the notion of network society. I don't know how much mm, people in, in this course have read about distributed communication systems. I don't know the familiarity with that kind of thing. Uh, less on my module, but they, they, I think they might have encountered this on other modules. Okay, I, it would be good to hear if, if uh, people know something about this. Uh, they've turned their microphones off. Does anyone, um, do we know about the network society and distributed network systems? Let's assume no. Let's go with no. <laughs> we'll go with no. Yeah, safer. Look, there was a guy in the early 60s who was an engineer called Paul Baran. There's two Paul Barans that come from the US that are very famous. One is a guy that wrote a book called uh, Monopoly Capitalism. And it was a required reading, I think, in the 50s or 60s. I can say whatever I want, but obviously I have no capacity of uh, ordering them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Sovereignty, sovereignty is over. There's no sovereignty here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. At least it doesn't lie in me. The Paul Baran I'm interested in is an engineer who in 1961 was commissioned by a right wing think tank called the Rand Corporation. The Rand Corporation had just received funding from the US Air Force. And the the research question that the Air Force posed is, if the Soviets attack us with a nuclear war, we know that the first stage of war will be nuclear war, but this will be followed by a conventional war, probably in a scenario, uh, the, the, the probable scenario will be Central Europe. So the question was, what kind of military communication systems could we design that would be capable of surviving a first wave of, wave of nuclear attack by the Soviets in order to be able to regroup our forces and start the conventional war in better conditions than them? So he wrote a, a very brief paper. I think it's about 30 pages. And he called it on distributed communications system. Yeah. On distributed communication systems. No. Why? It's karma. It's the it's the real. <laughs> it's the real. Yes, yes, yes. The real gets into the cogs of the symbolic. Exactly. So he he in this very brief document he gave the Air Force three options. The first one would be would be the cheapest one, which is a communication system that has the shape of a bicycle wheel, where you have the command, uh, the central command in the, well, the center of the wheel, and all the military bases will be that like the spikes of the wheel. So in order for one spike to communicate with the other, information had to go, the message had to go to the center to be resent. The brilliancy of this, he said, is that it's extremely cheap and it has zero redundancy. There's no repetition of information, no reiteration. The disadvantage is if we're, we're unfortunate and one of the nuclear bombs falls in the communication center, we're lost. There's no way of uh, reorganizing. His second model, he called it decentralized model, which is like a collection of bicycle wheels. The advantage of this is that it had, he presents some kind of statistical probability. Um, 
it has a better chance of surviving because you cannot be that unlucky that the Soviets will know exactly where all your communication centers are. So we'll lose some, but we'll have the rest to go on. It's like a decentered system. But he's, and he says that this works on the basis of redundancy. Information has to go through ser a series of places before it reaches its, um, its recipient. But then he said, there's a much better system, and he called it distributed communication system, which is based on massive redundancy, and it's more expensive, but it's on the indestructible. And this system makes every single military unit a communications a node. So the node has a shape, and the shape only exists because you connect the dots between them. It is as if if you, you probably seen now with the coronavirus, you have all these uh, computer generated images of how the virus is spreading in different cities. So you see larger size of circles around cities that have a greater rate of infection or a higher rate of death. Now, between all these cities, you can draw a line. But if you're flying on top of these, over these cities, you will never see any lines connecting them. If you go from Bristol to London, you won't see a line that is connecting uh, London to Bristol. You will only see a collection of buildings that you know because somebody tells you that it's called Bristol and another one that's called London. So you have to imagine that uh, the distributed communication system will work on the basis of nodes that connect with each other and that generate communication with one another. But if you imagine that there's an attack by the Soviets and several of these nodes are destro destroyed, this imaginary drawing of lines that we have done before will change immediately. That's something that uh, Gilles Deleuze and Felix Watari call rhizome. And they this, one of the characteristics of rhizomes is that the system is recombinant. They give us a metaphor of recombination, an ant, I don't know how you call the place where ants live. It's not a nest. An ant is, nest or an ant hill or, yeah, it's an ant nest. Okay, if you destroy it, he says, you, will, you can kill thousands of ants. But if, as long as you don't kill the queen, the ant colony, it's a colony, the ant colony will reconfigure in a different place with the remaining ants. That is a recombinant system. In the distributed communication system, if it is destroyed, if some of the nodes are destroyed, the remaining nodes will manage to reconfigure a communication system. And that's because there's no center. It's not a single center, it's not a multiple center system, but it's a system that lacks any center. Now, the idea of, uh, of uh, Baran predated the, uh, the notion of rhizome by about, 18 or 19 years. It's clear that the lesson was that he never read Baran, but you can see that the proposal, if you have, I imagine you would be more familiar with the lesson was that he then than with Baran. But if you think about this, the, the image that they're producing about, about what produces the identity of a totality has nothing to do with the body. It breaks completely with the metaphor of the body because this is, an identity that is being reconfigured continually in accordance to what you're doing together, how you're doing whatever you're doing, who wants to participate, and in the case of a military communication system, how many of the military bases are left after the attack. Yeah, so in, in real terms, in strategic terms, and also in, in terms of political organization, things like democracy, network technologies, they remove the body. I mean, people started to talk about postmodern war in the 1990s, didn't they, where war would take place without the physical proximity of bodies. So, you know, it would be like computer game type war. And now we have drone warfare and, and technological warfare as well. But at the same time as that, um, the body persists in, in kind of political ideology. I mean, as soon as you start to try to motivate um, people's political passions, um, then you start to you start to talk about bodies, don't you? You're always fighting for 
certain yeah. types of people and you're fighting against certain types of people. So what would you say is the status of, of, of images of the body? So if the real political thinking is, is, is never really involved the body, what's the status of the constant kind of ideological invocation of bodies in, in politics, implicitly or explicitly? What do, you, what do you think about that? They're always there. Look, the only thing that, I remember there, there was a line in a film by Woody Allen called Love and Death. And in this line, he has a philosophical discussion with his girlfriend and she's saying, uh, it's a long reflection about whether reality exists or not, it doesn't exist. But since Woody Allen just wanted to seduce her, he comes with another line that says, look, I don't know if it exists or doesn't exist, but there's something out there that's quite noisy. That's the body. There's something out there. You can talk about uh, postmodern warfare. You can talk about uh, computer, uh, sorry, uh, computer games, yes. Yeah. But the body will always be there. When I, when I say that distributed communication system give the final blow to the body, it's only the body as a metaphor of totality. Yes. It's the body as a metaphor for thinking, what is society, what is the what is the, the political community. The idea of community is reformulated. Actual bodies don't go anywhere. They're still there. Without those bodies, nothing really important will happen. You have this corporality of, for action. You do need it. Okay. I mean, there's a lot to, a lot of questions. It's almost like, so... I'm just trying to. So the 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 body is just it, for you in in terms of political theory. You think the body is is at best a metaphor, sometimes a kind of uh, a, um, a flag, sometimes a something to organize people. Um, what do you think about the status of of uh, people who say that? In the affect theory people, you know, ever since Deleuze and Guattari, from Foucault through Deleuze and Guattari onward, people have, have begun to say what, what Western thought has consistently forgotten about are the passions, the senses, uh, and, and the, the affective dimension of, uh, of life. And they've tried to kind of put that back in. I mean, is that even relevant to, to, to political thinking or is that just merely kind of like bureaucratic, strategic, how do we mobilize people? Or is it just the body is gone? I wouldn't say that it's purely strategic, tactical or anything like that, but it's a, you're posing a different question because before we were thinking of the body as a metaphor of, of society or politics, and now it's affect or the presence of the body of actually existing people if that is relevant to think political action. Uh, if it is with regard to the first part, I would say that the body is no longer relevant as an image of totality. But if we're talking about action, yes, it is. If, if you think about the question of effect, if I may jump here to an example from sociology, one of the greatest sociologists for sociologists is this man, Max Weber, who wrote Massive, a, a massive um, volume about the process of rationalization. And this is at the highest stage of society is the one that has uh, rational, uh, the process of rationalization in uh, instrumental, instrumental rationality and all that kind of thing. And he gives us the key example is bureaucracy. Because bureaucracy functions in terms of division of labor, uh, everybody knows exactly what they have to do, etc. And I think that sociologists uh, were very happy with that for almost a century. But towards the end of the 20th century, I would say late 80s, early 90s, I think, or probably earlier than that, early 80s, some sociologists started to say, that doesn't really work. And they started to do the kind of research that is wonderful to read, but painful to do, which is interviewing bureaucrats, uh, spending time in public offices, in corporate offices. And they started to discover the, that Weber probably said that because he came from a very highly rationalistic training and he never worked in an office in his life. And what they found out is, let me give one example of how effect works. And this is part of the patriarchal and sexist culture in which we live. 
what the researchers found out is that whenever a top executive or a district uh, bureaucrat was moved to another post within the company particularly he would take his assistants with him his personal secretary and the people that are closest to him or that would be part of the negotiation that he or she would do uh, before taking the new appointment and why was that uh, because they knew what they liked to eat what uh, their working rhythm was what they liked and what they disliked now that and, and on the other hand the bosses trusted the people that they took with them and they took them precisely because they didn't have to cover their backs the conclusion that these sociologists reach i'm trying to remember the name of these i think one is martin albright and i can't remember the name of the others the conclusion that they reach is that affect never left bureaucracy and in order to have a understanding of bureaucracy a, a better understanding of bureaucracy you have to factor into rationality the role of emotions affects and all the kind of stuff that was left out of any kind of academic reflection in social sciences for a while, except in psychoanalysis, psychology, and anthropology, perhaps. So for me, that is an index of things that are changing in social sciences that we're starting to pay attention to these things. How does this reflect in, um, in politics? If you look at, at the mobilizations that took place in the 60s against the vietnam war peace and love um, ludic use of sexuality i.e non-reproductive sexuality um whenever there was a demonstration you would not whenever but very often when you had demonstrations you would have a band playing now, I asked, uh, I asked a couple of people that are older than me that participated in these things, and I said, why did you think about always having a band or something like that? He said, because sometimes people only came because of the fun. Some people came because, oh, let's have a good time. They, 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 they had vague ideas of why they were there. They could know that, yeah, man, it's good to be against the war. But would they really get out of their couches to go to a demonstration, take a bus, take an underground. And they thought that music was quite attractive because at least they could party there. Yeah. Now, well, was, that, yeah. No, keep sorry. Going. sorry, sorry, keep going, keep going. Just one thing, it's for me, that is an understanding of um, that politics doesn't work only because of rational appeals, not just because we have a grand cause, but that there's other things that move people to political action, which is, fun which is uh, your friends are going to be there or because you think that the the people that are against your friends happen to be idiots yeah i was that was the next thing i wanted to ask about i wanted to ask about uh the status of bodies in relation to like political activism or political movements because you know the traditional image i mean the, in that book, um, Carbon Democracy, um, the author whose, whose name I can't remember argued that really for a long time through the industrial um, stage of, of capitalism, whenever you, if you have coal mines and factories and you're based on heavy industry, then workers who remove their, their labor and go physically on strike and stop working, they have a huge amount of power in their, in their hands. And that, that really informed our way of thinking about what political action is, that it has to be embodied. So you down tools and you stand on a picket line or you march and you physically gather as a massive body of energy who all have the same political demand. And that that's a really huge, um, powerful force, but, but only if that matters. So, I think, you know, in, in around, in the early 21st, no, in the, yeah, like, like in, in like 2000, from 2000 onwards, there you'd see enormous protests, enormous protests in capital cities around the world against actions, normally wars, Gulf wars. 
Um, but the government would just ignore them because it, it's almost like it didn't matter. And people were searching for new forms of, of, of political agency that didn't seem to involve your body or actually getting up off the chair and going somewhere and gathering as a mass, as a, as a, as a huge body of protesters. And people look to new forms of agency like, um, like the network society that we live in, like the, lit, like the social networks. And I'm just wondering um, what you think about the status of, the, of these older forms of political action that involve you know, embodied forms of connection versus the newer forms where people try to use disembodied, you know, social, socially mediated, technologically mediated forms of, of, of action. What, I mean, what do you make of that as a political theorist? I got interested in, in the early 90s with, I got interested about um, the use of the internet for political action. So I started to read some things about it. And some of the most interesting people were people that had read uh, Deleuze and Guattari's um, the, the, the book where Riesom is. A uh, Thousand Plateaus. Or a Thousand Plateaus. Plateaus. And there was, there was two groups. They were related, and both of them were based in New York. One was called the Critical Art Ensemble, and the other was called the Electronic Disturbance Theater. The Critical Art Ensemble was a collective in New York of anarchists or whatever that had read lots of Deleuze, and they were trying to use Deleuze and Watari to think the new medium of, um, of cyberspace. And their conclusion in a book on electronic civil disobedience was that uh, the old forms of, since capital was now mainly financial capital, and it was based on disembodied flows of information, currency, and investment, resistance by occupying space was irrelevant. We wouldn't be able to stop them just by taking over a building or closing a street as it used to be in the 60s and 70s. So <coughs> they generated software. Um, most of them were distributed denial of service, DDS software, that what it did is you organize an attack, for example, to the Frankfurt Stock Exchange, and you got a thousand people to simultaneously to ask to make a petition to the server in order to overload it so the server would collapse. And in some occasions, they were very successful. They managed to close down the Frankfurt Exchange for one day or for a few hours at least. I never bought that. I never bought that because it presupposes that physicality was um, a secondary actor, not a, not a central thing. Now, I think that we're reevaluating that because for a while, a lot of hacktivism, particularly in the 90s and the early 2000s, associated to the uh, anti globalization movement, Seattle, Genoa, and a series of other cities, they realized the limitations of purely digital interruption. They realized that there was a lot of money lost, but the symbolic and the the symbolic weight of bodies assembled together for something started to come back. And the, those who brought it back were the people that participated in the Occupy movement, starting with Tahrir in Cairo and going to Occupy Wall Street and the Indignados in Spain. It's people assembling, I'll have to make a distinction, people assembled in a space making a difference enforcing the establishment to take them seriously. Not as inter interlocutors, because it was very difficult to generate interlocution when you didn't have representatives, stewards, security people, or anybody like that. So the body was coming back in terms of occupying public space and staying there, creating tent cities. In the case of, uh, of the Spanish indignados movement of the, of what was it, May 2011, they were inspired by what happened in Tahrir. Tahrir led to the overthrow of President Mubarak in Egypt. And the people of Occupy Wall Street were um, inspired by the Spaniards who were inspired by the 
by the Egyptians. Now, what makes what is different from what you're saying is that in the 60s, you usually blocked access to an institution or a street. In this case, was having a physical present presence, almost like a passive presence in a public piece of land, usually a park or a square. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I'm not 100% sure about the consequences of the distinction between occupying a square or closing access to a university or to a, or to a company, mm -hmm. but there is something about bodies assembled that generate an energy to try to change the world. In either case, either blocking access or just staying in a public space. Okay. You have interaction, you have discussion, and you have a life that is basically a permanent assembly. Which leads us to, I guess, what should probably be the final kind of question, which we're thinking about why we're all separated from each other and why we're all locked down, which is the coronavirus, COVID-19. And we're seeing different kinds of visions of what will happen in response to this transformation or in response to this traumatic event. And on the one hand, you have kind of utopian, visionary, kind of hopeful socialist anarchists who think that finally we'll stop flying unnecessarily. We will value the working class. We will value frontline workers, people who work in shops, people who work in hospitals and so on and so on. The people who are now, we're regarding them as really frontline exposed, you know, uh, in a dangerous position, people fighting for society. Uh, with with their physical presence <clears throat> with other people, but on the other hand, there are news reports about the way in which the implications of the fact that the only way you can manage this is through absolute social, spatial control, social monitoring, kind of biotechnological monitoring, um, increased uh, autocratic rage, you know, increased autocratic powers, like really draconian police powers in certain countries. Uh, in East Asia, for instance, in the Philippines, where there's a shoot to kill order, uh, yeah. anyone who's flouting the rules. So I'm wondering, you know, and, and all of this is very much about the, you know, the possibility for, for, for freedom of physical space. So if what you're just talking about is the power of general assembly, of physical body to body um, connection and, and, and the kind of energy and, and significance that that generates in all kinds of ways, what I mean, I don't want you to predict the future, but what kind of implications does does the current global pandemic have for for embodied political action? Several years ago, in your own writing, you used to like Derrida's notion of the quasi-transcendentals, that is, something that can function as a condition of possibility and simultaneously as a condition of impossibility for something. You said that um, the pandemic forces us to, the virus forces us to isolate ourselves, to keep a distance. I would modify that slightly. The first thing is that I don't know who came up with this idea, this expression, social distancing, because it is not social distancing, it's physical distancing. The second thing is that we are talking together, and I don't know where. I don't know if how many people, if there are still people linked in or where they are, but if it wasn't because of the virus, we wouldn't be connecting. So that which separates us, the virus, because it forces isolation, is at the same time that which generates certain forms of sociability. In this case, a conversation that is taking place among people in different countries. You're in England, sorry, you're in Wales, I'm in Germany, and I don't know where the rest of the people might be right now. The same, I would say the same thing with the virus. Uh, one of the first readings I, I, of first philosophers I wrote about this was Giorgio Agamben. I thought it was just the, one of the worst things that I read. Gijek was just as bad, but this stuff was very bad because all what he did and I found it, found it a bit indignant, is to say, ah, that's what I always said, they, uh, bare life, that's it. They're using, they're using the state of exception, sorry, they're using the virus to extend the scope of the state of exemption that has become normalized. You, say, you see, 
That's what he's been saying for the last 30 years. He says that this will isolate us. No. When you see these people, of course, they're only symbolic things. They're gestures. People in Spain, in Italy, singing from their balconies in order to have a communication with neighbors whom they probably never did anything other than nod when they were passing by. When you see, I think also in the UK, people applauding um, frontline workers. Yeah. People that have been ordering from another country. I heard a story of Spain, people ordering pizzas for uh, nurses and doctors in emergency rooms have them from another country locating via Google Maps, mm -hmm. locating where there's a pizza place that is still working and ordering pizzas, paying with their credit card in order to show uh, appreciation for the work that they're doing. Now, for me, that is the opposite of isolation. It's the it's a demonstration that the, the, the emergency for the given the virus can generate the worst possible responses as it has been happening in Mexico, that nurses have been kicked out of convenience stores because stores because they might be uh, sources of infection. Yeah. Doctors that have been beaten up for trying to get into a bus coming back from their shift at five o'clock in the morning or six o'clock in the morning. You have that, but you also have this amazing level of solidarity and of awareness of other bodies. You're not in a square. You're not marching through the streets. You're not in, a, in an auditorium discussing. You're not in your seminar room at the university. But people find ways of connect. There's something about having a relationship with another body, connecting with another body that can that is occurring in a virtual medium like this, like Zoom, but something is happening. So, as you said, it's very difficult to predict what will happen. We know that changes will come, some of them extremely bad. I'm terribly scared that corporations are realizing that they can rely on, on the home office much more than what they thought, and it might work. And universities might think that the open university model of distance learning might be a possibility to explore to reduce costs but at the same time we're discovering that solidarity solidarity is still there that bare life is not the only thing that we're getting and that the state of exception might be an extension of the police powers of the state but at the same time without this state of uh, exception there's no way of ordering people to stay in their houses sometimes people won't do things voluntarily like for example pay their their taxes or help other people okay yes okay well that's been exactly 50 minutes which is not the normal length of a of a seminar so what i will do i will um i will thank you now formally then i will, the students can leave and then we'll chat for a few minutes if that's okay so thank you professor benjamin arditi um that was excellent um, thank you, students. Um, you're free to go. Uh, I will stop recording now, but but stay on the line, Ben. Uh,